So no, progressive Christianity is not about inviting people to sleep with whoever, whenever, however you want. It is about inviting the marginalized, the rejected, the brokenhearted back into communion with God. Hi, beautiful people. So today I'm responding to Paul and Morgan's video, The Problem with Progressive Christianity. Obviously, I'm in a new location. This is not my house. It's my friend Courtney's house. Me, my partner, and Valentine are staying here for about a week, and it's so gorgeous. You can't see, but I am just surrounded by mountainous views here in Topanga Canyon. Thank you, Courtney. Forgive me if there's an echo. I'm going to try to keep my voice down to prevent that as much as possible. So before we dive into this Progressive Christianity video, I do want to mention that I am building up the Patreon community community on God is Grey. The birth of our son Valentine will be available for patrons indefinitely, and I'll be hosting live Q&As at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on the 11th of every month from here on out. Our last one only had nine participants, so if you've got burning questions or your DM has been sitting in my inbox for ages, these Patreon Q&As would be a perfect opportunity for you to ask me your burning questions ASAP. I truly love connecting with the God is Grey community, so I would love to meet you all there. Now, now, we're talking about progressive Christianity and the dangers thereof. It's going to be very, very serious. serious. First of all, I do appreciate the humble posture in which Paul and Morgan approached this video. We're not coming to you thinking we're better than these progressive Christians. And I really hope that it does not come off that way. That noted, my goal is not to clap back or to prove that my views are superior. I'm responding to Paul and Morgan's video specifically because it really lays out the three most common myths I hear about progressive Christianity. My only hope is to dispel these myths and to explain what this confusing movement is all about. And please stick around for number three because it's all about sexual The first thing I'd like to address is how profoundly and deeply I understand where Paul and Morgan are coming from. After being a devoted evangelical for over a decade, there are two points in this video that genuinely pull on my heartstrings. Number one, it says in the first chapter of Romans, that if you essentially continue to harden yourself to God's law, that he will give you over to that. The wording that Paul uses is God abandons you to your sin. I don't know about you, but the thought of God abandoning me to my sin is terrifying. Morgan is laughing through this point, but what I see is a genuine sincerity in her words. When I myself began questioning purity culture, the prosperity doctrine, I was genuinely afraid that God wouldn't be able to love me through those questions, that he would indeed abandon me. And when you love God, that idea is so terrifying. And two, when those questions become actions, like when I stepped back from the worship team, or when I retaliated on my cheating husband by cheating on him, or when I pushed back on purity culture, I would have agreed with what Paul is about to say, that I was sinning without repenting and just expecting Jesus to love me through it. How can I satisfy my emotions, my flesh, my wants and desires, and then still fit that idea into some type of Christian bubble. And then Morgan adds the ultimate fear. And I'm still gonna get to heaven when I die. So again, it is terrifying to ask questions, to take actions, when you believe you could go to hell for doing so. And understandably so, Paul and Morgan wonder, what is it all for? Just so we can have sex with whoever we want? Is that worth it? If you know God and you're submitting to him, you're gonna abstain from sexual immorality. Which brings us to myth number one. Progressive Christianity is all about saying you love Jesus without doing what it takes to be a true follower. I think the idea of progressive Christianity is so appealing and so warm and fuzzy at first because there is no conviction, there is no condemnation, there is total acceptance of your sin. This is the most common misconception, that progressives want a faith that coddles our sin that we want to believe that Jesus will love us and accept us no matter what we do. But to the contrary, the progressives I know live a life of deep conviction. Linda K. Klein, Sarah Bessie, P. Enns, Nadia Bowles-Weber, Grace Baldridge, Kevin Garcia, the late Rachel Held Evans. When you read their books or hear their interviews, it is clear that they live to a high standard, morally, sexually, and spiritually. They, like myself, came to progressive Christianity not with a desire to sin, but with a desire to try truly understand our religion and our faith and its roots. And ironically, this next point about conviction is exactly what confuses so many of us. When the Holy Spirit comes, it talks about in the Bible that it will convict the world in regards to its sin. In evangelicalism, we've been taught that God 
hates the act of homosexuality, that when we touch ourselves, he cries, that women are not meant to be in positions of leadership. But when we don't experience genuine internal conviction for those supposed sins, we're expected to swallow that cognitive dissonance and move on. On the flip side, when progressives are convicted for eating inhumane meats or for shopping at stores that knowingly use child labor, or when we cry over what's happening at the border, many evangelical leaders laugh and mock us and encourage their congregations to do the same. The point being, progressives like myself are chock full of conviction. I agree when Michael says that conviction is beautiful. And it makes us uncomfortable at times. It really does. That's a good thing because yeah. it draws us closer to who he is. So if conviction draws us closer to God, when it comes to God's character, who's right and who's wrong. And it feels like a battle because when progressive voices rise, evangelicals are often told to ignore us, to believe that we're gonna lead them to hell. And there will continue to be people rise up who are going to quote scripture, who are going to sound really kind and sweet and sincere. And they're gonna say things that sound so good, sound so right. You can choose to follow them, but they're taking you down a very dangerous path. Which brings us to myth number two. Progressive Christianity is not based in sound doctrine. And it says in the Bible that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible's not outdated. The word of God, it doesn't change from season to season. This can really confuse us. Because when evangelicals talk about God's unchanging character, they're often only talking about male-only leadership or heterosexual lifestyles. Meanwhile, again, the progressive belief is that the Bible didn't stagnate 2,000 years ago. We believe that people continue to receive divine revelation that moves Christianity forward. And thank God, because the Bible clearly says women are property of their husband. What the Bible clearly says is that slaves must be obedient to their masters. Christians pushed back on the emancipation of slaves and used the Bible to justify that sin. If Christians didn't evolve through divine revelation, we'd be advocates of slavery. For the historical facts on this issue, please listen to my interview with Jamie Lee Finch. The last thing I'll say on this is that evangelicals are often made to believe they are the one true denomination. That's what I was taught. But there are Quakers and Episcopalians that fully affirm LGBTQ people and love Jesus. And it's not because they are bending to culture to appease people or to be cool. It's because they are committed to moving forward with the Holy Spirit. The same spirit that moved us away from slavery. And finally, last but not least, number three. Progressive Christianity was created to simply free believers of sexual accountability. It says in 2 Timothy 4.3, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers, teachers, to say what their itching ears want to hear. In truth, I myself have far more sexual accountability as a progressive than I ever did as an evangelical. I am indeed an LGBTQ affirming unwed mother who deeply honors God with my sexuality. Of course, and understandably so, Paul and Morgan might see this as an outright contradiction because their video speaks a lot about sexual immorality and God's supposed clarity on this issue. In progressivism, what it wants to do is wants to substitute God's law, his truth is explicitly written in the Bible to essentially what makes myself feel good. Why would God who loves me prevent me from doing something that I really enjoy, that satisfies me. But this point is a grave misunderstanding of progressivism. Sexuality within progressive Christianity is not about doing whatever you want without consequence because it feels good. Progressivism is about looking at church history and sifting through what is man-made toxic theology, theology that has deeply, profoundly hurt people versus what is genuinely divine and God-breathed. Because church and God are not the same thing. And we get those two confused all the time. God is reflected in a good church, but theology is not God itself. And when people are in pain, LGBTQ kids, unwed mothers, Christian couples who have had abortions, men who suffer ED due to sexual shame, we have to look more deeply. God says, look at the fruit, and this is what progressives are looking at. I've said a million times that the fruit of purity culture is rotten. God is gray, and progressive Christianity as a whole is about creating safe spaces where people can ask the tough 
questions. Questions that many of us were silenced or shamed over in our family and churches. And my sex life, though I share it freely, is not a blueprint for the God is Grey community. I am simply being honest about my personal convictions, my past experiences, so all of you feel emancipated and free to do the same. So no, progressive Christianity is not about inviting people to sleep with whoever, whenever, however you want. It is about inviting the marginalized, the rejected, the brokenhearted back into communion with God. This journey with Jesus is personal and it belongs to each and every one of you. And honestly, my prayer is there is a mass move towards progressive Christianity, that we're all set on paths with humility, that we stop mocking each other or laughing at other people's convictions. So dive into biblical research, look for wisdom in the stories of our spiritual ancestors in that text. Beyond sexual integrity, which is something that is deeply important to me and the progressive Christians I know, we also care about immigrants, we care about the environment, we care about the earth, we care about the divinity that's in animals, we care about others and love them freely, despite their gender, their orientation, their nationality, etc. And that's it. Please like, subscribe, share with your friends, donate to Patreon to see Valentine's birth video and for those live Q&As. I love you all. God bless.